thank you. Uh, I wish I were that good, um, but I can promise you I'm not. Um, and I have a really depressing agenda for you because I promise uh, that there is no topic that is more, um, frankly, scary or foreboding or generally annoying than that of getting old. I personally can tell you, from my point of view, it's not a great thing. Um, if you had another choice, you might want to take it. But since you don't, and um, frankly, since it's a part of our culture that I'm going to argue today, many people try to avoid um, or fetishize as a way of embracing. Uh, talking about it is that much more important. And talking about it in an intelligent or thoughtful way, um, which can be almost impossible, um, is what I think I think eludes us as a culture. So what I'm going to do in just a few minutes is go over some of the work that uh, the students have been working with me on a new project that I'm doing called The New Immortality, um, where that work has taken us. And I'm going to hopefully let you sort of see how our investigation has worked. There have been lots and lots of uh, fancy schmancy books written about aging. And of course, aging is just one way, one template you put on top of what it is for humans to grow older, to chronologically advance. You can also talk about it in terms of gerontology, the medical specialty where people think of aging, or history, the chronicling of how things age, people age, culture uh, ages. But when we have to present it country simple, aging is usually a chart. It's about how many people live to what age, right? What's the average, as this chart pictures, what's the average length of a life? And the United States is, as you can see, somewhere in the middle, doing better than a lot. If you live to be 40 years old in Afghanistan, you'd be pretty lucky or unlucky, depending on the quality of your life. Uh, if you wanted to live a really, really long time in the United States, then you'd choose Alaska, where the average age at time of death is 80, uh, and not Washington, D.C., where the average age is 72. But the effect of all of this is inescapable. Whatever country you live in, something like 30% of Americans, because of the shift in the ages of people who live here, something like 30% of Americans will be over 65. That's more than 88 million Americans in 10 years. And, you know, you could take that as an irrelevant sort of thing. I, it honestly wasn't a meaningful statistic to me until I considered how much of our country is actually designed to be a market for, to help those who are over 65. And the truth is, other than giving you discount movie coupons or Medicare, you know, life is pretty much what the Medicare folks call a donut hole. After you hit 65, and particularly after you hit 85, if you happen to live that long, in addition to all the indignities that are wrought by getting old, I mean, you know, you're way past wrinkles at 85. You're just thankful your organs are still there, right? <laughs> it's hard to do much. And those who conquer that, we view them as triumphing over this enemy called aging. So how do we think about that? Well, we think about it lately as a market. It's a market that is gigantic, $150 billion. And look at the things that are in it hormone replacement therapy. Now the largest market in healthcare is comprised by these things. Plastic surgery for restoration. We are told in the most recent set of business analytics that plastic surgery is growing so fast that after it grows during the period to 2019, 5%, it will be the most popular profession within medicine, right, as an elective field which is really quite striking, but just the tip of the iceberg. Supplements for anti-aging are now the largest market, outstripping even uh, the ordinary packaging of vitamins within healthcare over the counter. Uh, the number three largest sector in food and beverage now is anti-aging. Right? And I don't mean Ensure, which itself, as you know, is taken as feed for a large number of Americans uh, across the board and is marketed, well it's basically corn syrup and sawdust, marketed as though it is the slim fast of, of youth for the aging. I don't mean that. I mean food and beverage understood as the intentional act of trying to avoid getting older. So it's a package of carrots that say something on the package to tell you that you know these are the ones that will help you stay young. Similarly, L'Oreal and Avon's number one category now is anti-aging. So overall, the anti-aging skincare market is approximately a $5 billion market. The more conventional approaches have always been big, right? Get that gray out of your hair, I heard when I was a kid, right? So there's, there's this thing that I've given up on um, where, where our bodies, as they fail, provide new markets. If you don't like your hair color when you're young, whatever, it grows back. Right? But, but the nature of 
conventional approaches. Drinking red wine so you don't have a heart attack. Changing your hair color so you appear more vivacious. Hair restoration so you don't look like you're aging on top, right? Aspirin so you won't have a stroke. Garlic for good reason. January 6th of 2014, the FDA decided that this was such an expanding market within healthcare, but labeled as though it was circus fantasy life, that they would have to clamp down. And the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. said, if it in fact claims to counteract, repair, restructure tissues, or if it says it will rejuvenate you, retard you, well, retard aging, or control aging, then it has to be regulated. That's huge. Right? Because while the FDA presently tells any supplement company that if they make a health claim uh, and do not add the disclaimer at the bottom that says, you know, this article, not into, if you've ever listened to satellite radio, you've heard this. There's the, it sounds like a used car ad. This thing will make you potent. Your sex life will be fabulous. And then at 100 miles an hour, this thing will not diagnose, treat, or uh, ameliorate any condition whatsoever and is not intended to do blah, 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 blah. Right? Interest rates not included. <laughs> no guarantees. Everything is sold this way. And, and frankly, as long as there have been printing presses, there have been people trying to sell you a way to stay young. Everybody knows, though, that you can't. And however you understand aging, whether it's a simple matter of, you know, this year I'll have this birthday, or whether it's that you look in the mirror and your face doesn't look like it did 10 years ago, however you understand it, most of us have an explanation that's metaphorical at least, but usually even metaphysical. By which I mean, um, we point to something and say it's that thing that brought us down, or that thing that scared us. A mom had cancer, right? a nephew had cancer, a friend died in a car accident, most of your friends went to the military and half of them were shot. You live in South Central, right? I mean, however it's framed, Many of us have some articulation, but the one that is shared across American culture, the cleanest, is not worms, um, but it's what these worms have. It's this idea of lethal genes. And Francis Collins was the original director of the United States Human Genome Project, a geneticist from uh, University of Michigan. When he took over the entire NIH, uh, he gave a speech that most people remembered and to this day still quote, saying that all of us have inside us at least a few lethal genes. They're like time bombs that are waiting to go off. There's a gene for pretty much every kind of thing. And in C. Elegans case, this enormously big reproduction of a very, very small organism, there are only a few genes, and among them there are two that when they are expressed, uh, CED3 and 4, when they are expressed, the thing just goes off. So at about 12 to 13 days of age, C. elegans is done, because the switch is flipped, and that's the way it goes. It's this idea we have, you know, when you read about a gene for this, or a gene for that, that we all have these little switches inside, and they're going to go off at some point, and it happens. If your father had Alzheimer's and the grandfather had Alzheimer's, it's likely you're going to have it. Genes give us a way to articulate that, and we even have more sophisticated ways to think about it. We can, for example, talk about how uh, certain kinds of things like Parkinson, Parkinson's happen earlier and earlier with each passing generation. We have a lot more genes than worms obviously. So the number of ways we can die is not limited to one or two that will flip and we'd suddenly have a heart attack or a cancer. Things happen to us genetically that are complicated. And this is Frances Collins with a woman who has progeria. She is nine years old and has the appearance of someone who is 70. She's not aging, but she is aging. Our understanding of what it is to grow older is challenged by alternate forms of being alive, by different ways of aging, but also different ways of looking like we age. The genes that we get play an enormous role, we all know, in what it is like to be us as we age. You know, I graduated from high school in 1985. I, I drew the short stick in a hundred different ways, but somehow I look younger than the people I graduated with. Now, I don't know what that means to you, but to me it's awesome, right? <laughs> but, but I can tell you there are a hundred genes I wish I didn't have. Right? So, you know, one morning I'll wake up and my gallbladder doesn't work. That actually happened, right? And I know it was coming now, but I didn't know it then. 
Gattaca, a movie that came out in the late 90s, portrayed what that's likely to mean. Today, you can buy a gene kit from 23andMe or a number of other uh, groups like the Decode group in Iceland that sequenced all the genes there. And for about $100 or $200, you can have all your genes sequenced. The movie Gattaca took that to its natural conclusion. What if, it asks, you could not only get your genes and look them up on the internet and look to see what they translate into, but also get everyone else's genes? And in Gattaca, Ethan Hawke finally pulls a hair out of his head and hands it to Uma Thurman and says, you know, here, go sequence this and see if you still want to be with me. Now, if you knew, if you knew that it was highly likely that you would have a heart attack around 60 years old, and you could know. I mean, one of the studies I'm most proud of that I worked on was with the American Heart Association. We looked at three or 400 different mutations that are associated with early MI. And what we found was that you could actually point to at least a hundred of them and say with a pretty good degree of certainty that independent of environment, these people were going to die at a certain age range. So at 56 or 71, it was almost like Huntington's Korea, right, where you were going to be turned off like C. elegans. If you knew that about yourself, you had the data, or if you knew that was true of many people and had the data, and you were dating someone, would you choose to date someone whose life would end early? Would you choose to date someone whose life ended late? Would you choose to date someone who, and it goes on and on. And of course the gene picture is far more complicated. We now know that our genes change during our lifetimes, that the environments that we're in can change them even further. The upshot of this though is that there are hundreds of suicide genes. And indeed, not only do we all have lethal genes, but we're passing them on. And when we make choices about with whom we'll reproduce, or even whether we will reproduce at all rather than adopt, we're making those choices. And our children, and especially your children, will be making those choices the way you pick a menu you know, from your phone. So that question in terms of aging raises this question. This machinery that's inside us all the time that makes some of us appear to be older than we are, that causes some of us to have cancer or a heart attack, it is ultimately sometimes quite dramatic, but for all of this, it's always operating, right? If you get cancer, it's because a cell immortalized, and that immortal cell continues to reproduce independent of its environment. But if you don't have cancer, right this second, as your cells are regenerating, the telomeres on the caps of the chromosomes of those cells are getting shorter. And as they get progressively shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, eventually you've got gray hair. Right? Because the hair cells just won't make that color anymore. Eventually, you have wrinkles. Because the next generation of cell that's compressing and expanding won't have this elasticity gene, right? And therefore, it'll just lay there. And pretty soon, you're just not working anymore at lots of different levels. When you begin to think of that in terms of code, right, that things are just switching off, it's a more interesting and yet scarier picture. So this is a, a tree that I think is probably the best representation of how I feel about the idea. Um, one of my students found it. This is a, uh, I have to look at it again. This is a South Carolina oak tree that is 1,400 years old. It is not the only tree that lives for a long time. Lime trees often live 1,900 years. Bristle cone pines can live 4,500 years. Our bodies are in the environment in the same way. Trees can respond. I mean, look at this tree. Right? It's, it's gnarled up and nasty, but man, when you heard it was 1,400 years old, you kind of got to respect it a little more. <laughs> right? And we're like this too, right? Th those that you know that are getting older who happen to have either enjoy or suffer the fate of being able to live longer, their longevity gives you pause. When you meet that person who has lived a very long time and they're wise or they're cranky, Right? Or they're obstinate in a different way. Maybe they have an enormous amount of power. Maybe you think they're amazing because they seem less old than they are. Or maybe you think they're amazing because they're as old as the hills. And that fact is interesting. You know, the TV shows will say, 16 people turned 105 today. Here's a picture of, you say, ever seen this? Here's Ms. Bethel Jones, who's 199 years old. And there she is in a chair, breathing. Right? <laughs> Whatever you say, you notice. You notice because these wrinkles, these things that we acquire as our genes contact the environment, they come to define us in interesting ways. We become a kind of picture, a gnarled oak ourselves. And as you look at that picture, you pick up something that you couldn't have had when you were 20. It's something about the way the world changes you. You smoked, the sun changed your skin, 
maybe you did this like I do all the time, you're constantly moving your face around, you look at people's lines on their faces and the thing you see is the expression they often have. Right? And that thing, that picture of us as our hair and our ch skin's change, um, is a picture of what we're losing but also a picture of what we kind of have. And it's that observation that informed the earliest efforts to try to think about what if we could live forever? The earliest efforts to think about what's good about technology that aims to extend life. And the first book that we could find uh, is by a guy named Hufflin, who was Goethe's physician. And he wrote that what he wanted, or at least what he wanted for his patients, was that they could live as long as possible, but not live like an old dog. Uh, and I'm quoting here, just living fully and in good health. So it isn't essentially the number of years, it's the quality of life. Many people would agree with that. I, me, I go down with Woody Allen on this. He said, you know, it's great to think of yourself as being extraordinary and have your body of work live on forever, but I'd really rather I be there instead. <laughs> Wherever you come down, ultimately, it looks like this. It's not an American story, this story of Dracula. Um, the story of Dracula is, I think, ultimately the best way to explain what that kind of halfway superficial choice looks like. What is a vampire? In essence, what is a vampire? Blood-sucking white guy with pale skin, <laughs> Romanian, Transylvanian. What is a vampire? I mean, vampires, frankly, ha are the subject of more critical literature than you'd believe. Literally millions of pages have been expended on various versions of the vampire story, what they mean, where they go. Ultimately, what we know about vampires is that they, you know, they feed on us like a cancer. Right? They, as people feed off of the sexuality and sexualization of their victims, they de de derive youth from those they eat. Now, in some versions of the vampire story, they kind of have awful lives, or maybe you chop half their head off and they still walk the earth. Some of the TV shows about vampires are more interesting than others, in part because of the way they deal with that. But at its core, there's this Faustian bargain that vampires make. At some point, they agree. Right? Someone lets them in uh, to the house and says, yeah, please bite me two times, three times, whatever the magic number is, and they become themselves a vampire, able to live across all of time, but more importantly, like Goethe's doctor, not to look awful. <laughs> the vampire metaphor also has another twist in uniquely American terms, and that is, anybody know who this is? I'm, I'm always struck that people, people don't. He's the father from, thank you very much, you restored my faith in, in humanity. He is the father from the Munsters, and he's what the Faustian bargain usually works out to be. The picture of Dorian Gray, right? You suspend youth for a very long time in, in uh, Oscar Wilde's tale, but at the end of it, it all catches up to you and it's just horrifying. For, for the Munster picture, I mean, he didn't have a whole lot to start with. He, he, maybe you know the other, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the, the end run for the vampire is this, at the end of the story, the bargain you've made can't be fully played out. And so vampires in literature are always sad creatures in the end. They always suffer from being vampires. That fact is at the core of the argument that we're trying to make. In our research, we've decided to at least claim that there are four ways in which Americans, uniquely, of course, because as de Tocqueville would have it, Americans think that Americans are uni unique in all respects. Um, <laughs> Americans uniquely created this massive 150 million, sorry, 150 billion dollar market in anti-aging. We have driven South America and Europe along with us into Botox, but the American attitudes that inform it, we argue, are a product of four different ways in which Americans don't like the elderly. Uh, and we derive these from doing some interviews that I'll talk about at the end if there's time or I can answer questions about. Um, the first one is, we disvalue the elderly because of our work ethic. Americans, and when I say we and our here, I'm just referring to Americans broadly, by which I mean people living in America across the last 30 years as represented in literature and interviews. Uh, Americans disvalue the elderly because of our work ethic. Productivity is our most profound standard, more so than in many other countries, but certainly in any other country with which I'm familiar that functions in a similar economy. Our most pronounced standard being productivity is very evident when you look at how employers think about their workers, right? In the United States, when activity is diminished, life is disvalued. This is true for populists of all stripes. Liberals say it too. Uh, President Clinton said that people view life as empty without work. 
President Obama said that the dignity that we give to older Americans is shown when we give them a way to express and enact the value of their lives. Playwright Charles Kerr famously said that what it is to be American is to labor toward something, toward this, toward that, toward whatever, but toward something. So why do we exempt some people from that, like children? Because even though children are worthless, <laughs> you know, they don't do a whole lot of work anymore. Um, they do at least have a future and, and that idea that children have potential and are aiming at the goal of where we'll go to college or what will, be their, what will they be someday, right, is itself a kind of productivity. This happens at the other end of life too. Farmers don't want to choose not to farm anymore. In our heartland, people want to die in the harness. It is a central tenet of Protestant ideology around the United States that it is better to wear out than rust out. In 2009, uh, the United Nations did the only study I could find about the perception of inactivity and they revealed that in 65 of the largest nations in the world, inactivity is viewed as suspect in itself. If you're not being productive, right, idle hands, then you're bad. Aging is that fear in some ways. In another sense, uh, we disvalue the elderly because of our bent toward the future. The problem with being old is there's no future in it. Right? And, and the rapid technology that we have, I mean, you know, it was bad 10 years ago in this regard, but now I can remember 20 years ago buying a first dishwasher and looking down and it's like, you know, this is great, but why should I pay $500 more for the Bosch or the Sub-Zero or whatever? The answer is because it's this year's model, right? And what we like, what drives markets within the United States model for innovation and our, the way that we capture um, the development of, of stock and growth in markets more generally, whole ecosystems thrive on it, is that there has to be a new model. There will be an iPhone 7, whether there's anything new to introduce or not. The iPhone 6S, and I've got one, right, with the pushing down on the glass, it's the same phone, <laughs> right? I mean, it, and yet, the entire campaign, in classic irony that is unique to the United States, is about how the only thing that's different is everything. We sell the new model in itself. Right? And this rapid technological advance is what makes that happen. We rush to upgrade because there might be a security problem in our phone or our computer or whatever. And as a result, we think this way. Right? Um, there is less value for a has-been than for a will-be. Those who are over 65, a famous Colorado governor once said, have an obligation to die. Zeke Emanuel, the, the designer of Obamacare, bioethicist in Philadelphia said he plans to die after he hits 76 and a half. Maybe it's 77, I don't know, maybe he gets an extra six months. But either way, the point is people who are ready to calculate about these things come to conclusions like that, that at some point, as, as uh, Colorado governor said, you have an obligation because we don't have enough money for everybody else. And after all, you've already had a life. Let the others have it. If you've got a piece of a liver and you've got an infant, and you've got someone who's 65, listen, in Germany or England or any other country but the United States, right, you know who's going to get that liver piece. That's how we think. So Jack London's essay, The uh, Law of Life, is what the students and I worked on when we were thinking about this piece, which is um, a story about leaving an old Indian chief named Koskushat uh, out by a campfire, and there he'd stay and there he'd die. You've probably told similar stories yourself. You know, they push the old guy out in the, in the, on the ice. The ice flows. There are narratives about this in virtually every language of which I'm aware. The idea that those who are aging choose that at a certain point, the amount of resource they consume is gigantic. I mean, I can tell you, I'm, in universities, this happens all the time, and I'm increasingly suspect any time I'm walking on ice for that reason. If you're a full professor at a university in 2016, you're consuming the resources of three assistant professors, right? And if you didn't know, it's because you weren't listening because they're telling you all the time. <laughs> right? This, this idea, right, that there's an entitlement in many, many cultures and subcultures and industries have it. The third reason is because we disvalue the elderly out of our own penchant for power. Power's great, right? And whether it corrupts or not, we like it. When you are aging, power is what is fading. Your eyesight is less acute. Um, your reflexes are slower. I can't hear anything. 
You know, I mean, in class, listen to how loud I am. In class, I can't hear a thing. Um, your memory fades, right? I mean, think about how we process memory. It's like a scratch pad. The ability as, as, as uh, demyelination occurs and less and less of our frontal cortex is able to take in information and rapidly, uh, it's as though you didn't have post-it notes or a pen anymore and that was the only way to write down information. Right? As memory fades and hearing goes away, the value of life is seen by many to be reduced. We institutionalize the value of having power in our culture. The United States is special in that regard. We are especially good at creating new technologies that make it easier to be more powerful when you have more capacity. We even talk about it as a product of the things that we sell, right? So it's planned obsolescence. Marshall McLuhan said there is no more American concept than planned obsolescence. That, that idea, that is, that you know, my mom simply will not use a smartphone. Now, I have begged and pleaded. I've given her multiple ways to do this, and I gave up. That's planned obsolescence, right? As I'll talk about later, we live on Facebook, or whatever version of that you're on, and that being, right, excludes a whole generation. Now, imagine, right, that, that hasn't happened to the level it's happening, happening now in a very long time. But being excluded from digital life, um, I think has a, a profound effect. The fourth reason is we disvalue the elderly because we have a fear of death. This one's pretty straightforward, right? Like, do you want to die? No. You're not sure? The guy you knew didn't. Anybody here want to die? Raise your hands. Do you hope to die ever? Okay, well, there's two of us. <laughs> Thir three. Do you not fear it, but what? But it doesn't mean you want to. Do you hope to ever die? I can tell a story, I bet, where you'll want to, right? I mean, if we tell a story where you've had, I won't. If I told a story about you having a full life, as Aristotle would say, if you're having a flourish, in which you, you know, at some point have had the family that you wanted, the career that you, whatever, whatever it is that for you would mean flourishing, and then everything in front of you was something that I think you wouldn't want, right? You'd embrace that story if there were death in there. Or maybe not. And that thing of, of being afraid of death is easier in our culture because we don't often embrace it, and particularly not in waspy culture. That is, there's a, an element of US culture that involves um, the evolution of, let's call it, patterns for thinking about how we die and how we think about dying. Um, I remember the first time I ever went to a Jewish funeral. Um, I was in Philadelphia, and one of my graduate students' fathers died. Um, and he only had one of them died. Uh, he, he, he was, I went and I thought, I'm going to learn all about Jewish culture now, you know, I'm from Waco, Texas, so was as far from that as I could possibly be. Giant funeral, zillions of people, and everyone who was going to stand up uh, did so with relish. And every single person who talked in the service or after the service talked about this guy who had been the head of all of Philadelphia McDonald's restaurants, talked about his awesome business. Some of them literally talked about his margins. Right? It was like his life was, he is, he, and you'd think he wasn't dead. They didn't talk about how he went to heaven. They didn't talk about how he would be resting forever. In any way, it was all about how great his life was. Some parts of American culture do focus on this notion that there are things that made your life great, and those are the things we're going to talk about. But most of American culture about end of life is burial culture. We don't like death. We deny it. We pretend it didn't happen. Right? When someone tells you that your mom died or your brother, that's what you do. You say, no, it can't be. We deny, our, we have a, an entire culture of sociologists within our country who for generations now, since the Stages of Dying books first came out, uh, have argued that there are ways to deal with that. And they all involve this basic assumption that we deny death. We substitute euphemism for it. They passed. They've you know, gone on to another place. We prepare the body in this culture for presentation largely out of that same uh, set of properties. Americans invented and perfected the art of uh, th this way of making the corpse appear to be still alive. It gives us a, a distance, frankly, and people often comment. If you've ever been to a funeral where there was an open casket, you've heard someone say, wow, it looks like he's still alive. Right? Um, you know, there are careers around this, doing the hair, etc. The denial of death does obviously include the distancing of ourselves from everything 
that reminds us of death. The smell of death is the piece I think of when I think of this. If you've ever been in a nursing home, if you've worked in a nursing home, many of the students that I teach have uh, or do, there's a thing that scares people off. And you'll see customers come in and get right out. And just as we have made funeral homes in the United States the happiest, friendliest guys in the world, right? Um, we have made a market out of what it is to deal with those as they are aging. And the capacity of American culture to renovate end-of-life care, which I'll talk about, um, is also one of the things of which we can be most proud. So you can see in this fourth piece what I want to say. That is, there are ways in which we talk about how to die that we can deal with. Right? But for the culture generally, <coughs> so it's a place where this study is focused, we have two different ways of thinking. One has to do with being afraid of death, not liking the smell, the taste, the, anything about the way it looks, and also this kind of second piece, which is the circle of life, right? The disnified version of reincarnation. The American language that says, death isn't really happening because in the death there is a rebirth. So, you know the movie, the Lion King thing? You know, so, right. so this, this idea is we're going to feed things and things will feed each other, or, um, you know, you could look at it in a number of different ways, but. In the, the Conrad, the Conrad approach, it's, we are uh, ultimately just meat. We are moving from one place to another. The, the fifth way of talking about this isn't really a way at all. It's a way of talking not about denying death. It's a way of captioning this whole problem. Many of us who struggle, maybe you do, maybe you don't, with the four different ways of denying and disvaluing uh, aging that I've talked about, have thought about what you yourself will do not to grow old ungracefully, maybe even not to grow old. Um, the model for that is also one I think that comes from genetics. Um, this is spherical volvox, and it is one of the eight uh, miracles of the, the biological world, uh, because spherical volvox does not die, ever. In the process of reproduction, it actually regenerates its own genes. And by that, I do not mean it clones itself. I don't mean that, I don't mean we're not here with bananas. Spherical volvox just doesn't die. It is um, a, an, an, an unique organism in all of our understood biology because of that. And for that reason, it is kind of an illustration about how people think about aging when they're thinking about their proxy. Now, some people say, I'm going to live on through my kids. And many people even make that a project, right? They call their kid junior or the third. They will, uh, my, most of my research in my career has been around genetics and the question of how, how much parents' visions of their children's ideal future actually inform what their children do. Sometimes they work too much, sometimes they don't work at all, but in any event, one model for how you will continue and not die is spherical volvox, that you'll just, you know, make more and live on yourself, which is of course an illusion, it can't really happen. Others do exactly the opposite. That is, they think of themselves as utterly independent from their children. This is a, a typical ad for a typical brokerage firm, right? As soon as you have a career, you will begin in the United States the process of saving money for yourself because our safety net doesn't really do it for you anymore. It may not have ever done it, but, but in the U.S., if you are lucky enough to earn enough money that you can uh, save money toward retirement, you'll do what this guy does. And the, the extreme version of saving for retirement is saving for retirement against your children, right? So there's a, a famous bumper sticker from the 70s, uh, used to be on the back of RVs that said, I'm spilling, spending my children's inheritance. You seen this? It happens, right? I mean, the models of investing have two kinds. One is to spend out all your money, and the other is to pass on something to future generations. One of the central critiques of the aggregation of wealth in the United States is that all this money keeps getting passed on, right? One generation after another, after another, maintains the money through tax loopholes and et cetera, et cetera, so we effectively have little monarchies. This model, though, means more than that. It's a philosophy. It's a way of talking about coping by aging well. When you're 40 years old, you see pictures like this and they work because what they're selling is, well, what it says, right? I'll have a boat. I mean, my life might be awful right now. I work for a bad boss, I whatever you think, and then, and then you imagine that one day when you are, you know, hopefully not falling apart in your vision, that you're going to be able to go out and, and disappear from this moral coil without an eternal life. You're going to have a boat. 
whether your boat is an airplane or a cabin in the woods or, you know, that you go get to live near your, your, your grandchildren, but you don't actually take care of them, whatever it is, right? The fantasies of 20 and 21st century America about retirement are the opposite of spherical Volvox. They're saying, focus on you, you know, save some money. And it's all true. I mean, the language that's used to illustrate these investments is all accurate. If you save when you're young, when it seems like you're never going to die, that amount of money increases in value vastly beyond what you could ever do if you only came up with this dream when you were 55 or 60. You can't keep up, right? So there's this model. And that money funds American commerce. These mutual funds with stuff we don't even know we own, right? You, who knows what's in it? It's a share of God knows what, 100,000 shares divided up into little tiny chunks, but we own something and that thing drives us toward the future. Philosopher Eric Fromm says that there are these two models, the, the, the spherical Volvox and the boat, that help us cope and they really define us into two kinds of people in this culture. Fromm said, writing of, of, of the um, time in which he wrote, and really not our time, so we're talking about uh, 50, what, 30, 40, 50 years ago, Fromm says that we are really two kinds of people. One kind is a necrophiliac and the other kind is a biophiliac. I love this model, so I want you to like it. The necrophiliac is the pale, kind of, they're often very pale people. They're usually fairly depressed. Uh, you encounter them a lot, the necrophiliacs. They're more than half of society, he says. And the necrophiliacs tend to gravitate toward positions of bureaucratic power. Fromm says necrophiliacs, as the name suggests, they kind of like dying. They like the process of aging. They like, they like, they feel very acutely that life is a process toward death. And the necrophiliac in power um, is really just trying to help other people themselves enjoy the process of losing power and aging and dying. And you know, You've worked with a necrophiliac today, I guarantee you, on this model one time or another. They were the person who said no before you asked the question, right? Their job, their power, whole parts of academia are constructed just to give jobs. The Full Employment Act for necrophiliacs um, is academic bureaucracy. So the other side is the happy side, the biophiliac. The biophiliacs, Fromm says, are very much lively people who love nothing more than to help others grow. Right? I, I call myself a biophiliac. I, totally thrive. I fetishize the idea that people should grow and learn to create for themselves. Absent that though, the biophiliac falls apart. People who love to teach often have this experience. Professors die much more rapidly after they retire than other professionals in the same category. Why? Because there's nobody to help grow. Right? Professors don't often enjoy corporate culture for that reason. So what do you do to accomplish either of these two aims? The internet. Because that's what everybody does for everything, right? And there are lots of ways to go at it. Google is almost as filled with anti-aging, as you'd predict, as with porn. I mean, there are zillions of these sites. Zillions. Just Google anti-aging. You'll be stunned. Zillions. And, and most of them offer something legal. But there's also the you know, Mexican jumping bean sites with artificial Viagra and artificial... You know, I mean, if there's a part that you have that's broken, somebody is selling something that probably isn't real, right? but that looks really special um, on the internet. You can focus on stretching out the years with these things. One approach of either the biophiliac or the necrophiliac is to extend aging longer with supplements. Another option uh, is to just think it through in terms of self-help. Right? I mean, it's one of my favorite charts from Forbes. Uh, this is a, a list that they identified by surveying medical, sorry, business school professors. And these are ranked in order of which they were mentioned. Most mentioned was don't oversleep, be optimistic, makes sense, right? Like you'd think you wouldn't be able to live longer by being cranky. Have more sex, right? Uh, get a pet, get a whatever that is. Be rich, don't smoke, chill out, eat your antioxidants, and marry well. Okay. I mean, it's another way to think about this process, right? Whereby you are moving forward with the intent of not losing the thing that defines you. You can be crazy, too. Anybody know who this is? That's right. This is Michael Jackson in his oxygen chamber. Michael Jackson believed that it would be possible to live for a very long time if only he put himself down in this chamber and, and, and took oxygen. And indeed, oxygen, as you, we now know from the oxygen bars that people visit all the time in Vegas and wherever, um, is, it can be quite invigorating to, to, to try, but it's a metaphor, really. 
It's just a metaphor. It's a, it's a more intense pursuit of not being old. And we do stuff like this in many ways. This metaphor of intentionally building machinery around you that will make your life more vivid. I'll give you an example in my own life. Um, I moved to Kansas City to take a, a chair there and worked in, in downtown Kansas City and, and said to people, hey, I don't know where to live. Kansas City is awesome. You don't know it because none of you in this room have ever been there, I'm sure. But, but Kansas City is awesome, and, and I'm thinking about it because we had a conversation about it earlier today. The condo where I wanted to live and told people I wanted to live is right in the middle of downtown. It's kind of scary downtown. People said, you're not, you don't really want to live there or whatever. Um, but I met a guy who was building this condo building, and he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, if you look at the demographics in this or any big city with a lot of money, you'll find that there are two groups that have a lot in common people from 25 to 35 years of age and people from 65 to 85 years of age. And what they have in common is they all think they're 25. <laughs> so we built a building that put them all in the same place, right, with a cool swimming pool and a cool workout room, whatever, designed to make both of those demographics think they were the same person. I mean, it's a crazy pursuit. It cost tens of millions of dollars, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Either way, um, it's an interesting approach, and it has in common, whatever the, the form of it, that it feels good. These high-tech approaches, no one chooses them if they're, if, if Michael Jackson had to be stretched in both, well, he might have, but I mean, if you, if, if you pick an approach like this and it involves living in a prison, nobody chooses it. It's an approach, generally, that doesn't involve a lot of effort. I'm sorry you can't read this. It's a bad picture I took, but this is a mouse, and he says, have you seen my stem cells? And I put him up there because the truth is that there's lots of data now that suggest you might be able to accomplish these purposes with technology. There are plenty of people eager to sell you something that will help you to live longer. Some of these technologies might be worked out. Anthony Atala at Wake Forest has been working for decades developing artificial things. He grows from stem cells artificial vaginas. He's grown a complete pancreas. He's grown a whole human kidney and he's implanted this stuff into people. I mean, he grows it from scratch, like, you know, like if you're watching Iron Man or something. I mean, it's just like a 3D printer of a pancreas. It's awesome. Maybe what we'll have is a thing derived from something inside us, a, a, a pharmaceutical product that comes from, uh, from stem cells. But either way, this more Puritan path that's more painful isn't quite as popular. People like the idea that maybe the thing with aging is I lost something, you know, um, but they don't necessarily like the idea that getting it back would be this weird. You know, it's like this is a picture of the artificial uh, kidney growing in its bubble of, I mean, look at that, right? That's weird, <laughs> unless you had no choice. And uh, there are versions of this all over fiction. Iron Man um, is the ultimate version. What happens to, to, to Iron Man that he ends up being Iron Man? Anybody remember? How does Iron Man get his power? He lost his heart. He was blown apart by a weapon from his father's own weapons company. It was awful. He's cored in the middle. And so what does he do? Builds a nuclear heart. Yeah, builds a new one. He builds a nuclear heart out of a, a weapon itself. And so he is like the perfect American metaphor. This is comic book culture gone full tilt. The idea is that we will take the things that are worst about us and build the things that are best. We'll build, you know, knock swords into plowshares. The, 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 the very essence of American industry is that we will find a way to have parts help us out. It's like stem cells, but more complicated. And it, in essence, is the metaphor for exactly what we're doing right now. People don't get artificial arms anymore. They get human processing units, right? We're very, very close, as usual, to what Star Trek predicted just a few years ago. There are multiple devices now in place from Albany um, that allow people to think with motion. They are able to, to you know, think a pen to move or think a, a, another sort of device so that they have a neural direct connection to the outside world. So there's the parts approach. And then another approach to this problem is to think of yourself as being frozen. Right? I, I call this the hold button. Um, what the students say when they're articulating this possibility uh, is that this hold button of freezing yourself cryogenically, so after you die, head chopped off, put it into uh, uh, cryogenic freezing and then keep it there. The notion being that you could be reanimated, a subject for another talk at best. Um, <laughs> the idea here is that you just stop, right? I mean, if you knew you were going to die soon, you went in the lab or, you, or ideally if you pay for these plans, you, you went into the lab as, as close to possible after you died. 
your head's frozen, and later the technology will exist to reanimate you. The Soviets brought dogs back. They did head transplantation, right? There's all kinds of crazy stuff that might be possible. Who knows? But the bottom line is the philosophy. It's that you're so awesome, right, that 50 grand to freeze yourself so that you could come back and forget everybody else is a way of thinking. So it's a, a, a necrophiliac association. Then one final understanding, which is um, essentially that we freeze ourselves, but into silicon. And this understanding is really, it's, it's actually happened already, right? We are already people who are generally existing within a culture that is silicon. We are already on Facebook. We exist in important ways in our devices. Um, my kids will remember very vividly, I guess it was last January, I was, or February, I was playing around on my, this laptop, and I got up to make myself a cup of coffee, went in the kitchen, and poured it in, whatever, all, all set, and, and it had asked me for, to make a new password on my computer before I went, so I made a new password, and I, I went into my little, I used a Mac, so I went into my little notebook program and wrote the password down in the notebook program, right? And then I got the coffee, whatever, came back, and guess what happened? Computer had gone to sleep, locked by the password that I don't have. Now follow this out, okay? The password's in the notebook. The notebook's in the computer. I don't have a password. <laughs> but the notebook's also in my iPhone, right? So I open it up and I push the button and, and wait, it wants the password too because the password changed on this and I've been giving the wrong password. So now I can't get in my iPhone. Oh, but wait, it gets worse, right? Because I'm a true Apple devotee. I did what they told me to do. I turned on file encryption on my laptop, right? And I did what they told me to do. I locked my computer to my Apple password. So the password I changed wasn't just my computer, it was the Apple password. But it gets worse, wait. What they really tell you, if you've gotten a new Apple lately, you know, they tell you to turn on two-factor encryption. And one of the reasons two-factor encryption has been changed is because of this story I'm telling you. Um, two-factor encryption works this way. It prints a code, right, that no matter what your actual password is, you have. It's a paper code that you can have. Then there's your actual password. Then there's the, um, what is the third thing? Oh, the, the, the question and answers, I guess, that you can give about your, 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 yourself. But with two-factor encryption, if I'm telling the story right, you have to have at least two of these things. Oh, no, no, the, the, it's not the, the question and answers don't work if you have two-factor encryption. The other one is you have to have another device on which your ID exists, right? So here's my problem. I call up Apple at 2 o'clock in the morning and I say, holy, I gotta teach tomorrow, <laughs> right? And, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden something occurs to me. I'm not even a human being. I'm like not, I can't function without this device. I go get a time machine backup, the Apple version of backups, I plug it in. It instantly asks me for my password. I find an old backup, it's two years old, two years of my life, it's gone, right? So there's nothing, there's no way in that won't come back into this circle. So I go to my friend Abe, if you know Abe down in, uh, Somehow Abe comes up in every conversation. But I, go, I go, go to my friend Abe down in engineering and I say, Abe, the cyber hacker guy, um, help. <laughs> There's no way in. We call Apple. Apple says it can't be done. We don't know your password. You can't use your clues. You don't have the paper thing. I don't have the paper thing. I haven't had the paper thing in two years, right? Apple says forget it. We call he's got a buddy at CIA. Nope. NSA? Nope. We call the most expensive decryption company that exists, and I offer them thousands of dollars. Nope. It's junk. I call my friend at Apple and I say, hey, you know, this thing, I like, at a minimum, I'm giving up on the data. At a minimum, can you, can, can you get me back in here so I can restart the thing? No, because, get this, when you use two-factor encryption and the other piece, you're firmware locked on the computer, which means if you can't put the password into the computer, the computer is, as he said, bricked. Well, this is university's computer, <laughs> right? So that's a $3,000 expense for nothing. The upshot of this story is locked in silicon, this is Captain Picard, the only true hero in the world, um, being assimilated by the Borg. The truth is that Apple didn't just have my data, they had everything, right? Everything, all that software I bought, it's all in Apple. I only own a license to it. Music, it's just a license. Movies, it's just a license. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in my case, but more than that, Right? All the passwords I had to anything else were on that same notebook, locked in my Apple. 
hundreds of accounts, different I mean, I'm not that complicated of a person, but I had been a devotee of this thing forever. And Apple did it because they wanted to keep the government out of your business. So get where this goes, right? They changed two-factor encryption after this, and it's actually a longer and much more interesting story for another day. He did hack into it. He, we got a couple of, like, Russians, and they <laughs> sold us some, I'm not kidding, they sold us some bootlegged hardware that they were using through a telephone number in San Francisco that they were using, and an entire lab somewhere in Buckman ran decryption codes brute forced its way into this laptop until finally I got in a month and a half later. So I have my laptop back thanks to hacking, right? <laughs> but what if I hadn't, right? Like every paper I wasn't finished with, et cetera. Yeah. Why couldn't you remember your password? Yeah, exactly, because I'm old. <laughs> Full circle. So that, but why you can't remember your password is ultimately at the very, very beginning of this, this whole story. You can resist it. You can resist ultimately all these processes about aging, but um, in the end, the question of how you'd resist, I think I pushed a button here. Maybe the computer heard me. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but in the end, as, as Tom Stoppard said, uh, one of my favorite playwrights in his uh, screenplay for the Terry Gilliam movie, Brazil, um, the things that you do to make yourself younger, your complications from those, they themselves then have complication. Nobody has plastic surgery once, right? These processes that we engage in to keep ourselves as we imagined that we were. They themselves have costs and the cost often is that we are not able to move forward. So the effort for us ends in, in some suggestions. We tried to figure out how to decrypt um, the logic of these four ways in which Americans deny death and suggest alternative views. And I'm going to present you with the basic ones that we suggested. The first is affirm the value of all human life. That is, we have a basic commitment in this same culture to egalitarianism, to the idea that everyone has value. Now, this would be the opposite of GTA 5. Right? I, I use GTA 5 in my public health law class because in GTA 5, when you, anybody know Grand Theft Auto? It's one of our most important cultural landmarks. So uh, in GTA 5, if you make the police angry, they shoot you, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what you do wrong. The police come and they shoot you and you eat more and more stars and the rest of it. Egalitarianism is a function of a way of developing human relationships early on in children's minds such that you don't learn to be a citizen by shooting people all day long running in a circle. You can affirm the value, whether you play video games or not, you can affirm the value of egalitarianism only if you understand this idea that the social Darwinism that underlies a lot of American culture has as its anecdote, uh, antidote um, functioning in ways that affirm the value of everyone, even the people who make the police mad. The value of diversity is profound. That is, we need to see the value of age and diversity more than we do. And here again, some cultures do better than others. Professor culture um, often doesn't value age as much as others. Aging teach us lessons. That is, all humans have limitations. You can learn a lot from someone who's older than you. I heard and ignored <laughs> when I was 20-something years old. Take change in stride. This is the Margaret Mead lesson that those who have experienced change teach it to experience, teach it, teach it to us so that we can experience it ourselves. If you're not willing to listen to someone who already had the mistake and, and, and in, endured what it was like and would like to prevent you from enduring it, then at least listen to the notion that the person who made the mistake can teach you how to, how to deal with it when you do. Right? Um, take change in stride, yes and recover the value of rest and celebration. That is, um, Nobel Prize winning investigative journa journalist Studs Terkel um, said when he was investigating human life and aging himself uh, that youth is grand for kids, but it shouldn't be a life sentence, right? The idea here being that we can learn best the value of rest and the value of, of encountering a life in which it is possible to rest when we learn to celebrate it and uh, to enjoy the fact that you don't have to always be that person who's trying to get ahead. It is actually possible to enjoy life in a steady state. The stock market is not designed for people who are 70 years old, right? Growth stocks, no, income stocks. Um, so this is the model. The sixth uh, that, that a student suggested is that there are special needs to care for the weak. That it is actually, in fact, basic to the same worldview that seems to disvalue aging that also those who are weak in our culture need it. America leads the world in emergency care, right? You can be penniless, oh, the world, all the money. You can be a guy with a gun who just shot six people, and if you fall down, 
dead in the street, we will haul you to a hospital and try to bring you back. We are the rescue culture. We rescue anything with a pulse, right? So that value uh, may have an instructive thing. So that's, that's essentially where, where this project has gone to date. Um, it is definitely an experiential project, as you can tell. Um, and I want to actually be uh, thankful not just to the class, but also to my dad, who died a couple years ago, because we began this project together um, when he was alive and was a professor and did much of what I did. And in particular, then I also want to thank uh, both Hanko and, and the library who have just started a collection uh, made up of, of some of his works, all of which were uh, unique and focused on different aspects of human life. His name was Dan McGee. So anyway, thank you. <laughs>